for your patience uh, while I gave that instruction in Spanish. Once again, welcome to another face-to-face -face session. Today we are doing uh, health and wellness. So some quick things to note uh, before we get started with today's session. So this session will be recorded. We wanna make sure that uh, the parents who are unable to join us today are still able to gain this knowledge uh, from today's session. Uh, you can see this session as well as all of our previous sessions in our YouTube channel. And that link will be in the chat for you all to use. Uh, we will have a presentation uh, followed by a conversation with Justine and Ellen. Uh, the chat uh, will be open for any questions. Like I mentioned, uh, we will get to those at the end, uh, but please feel free to ask them throughout the presentation so they don't leave your mind. Uh, please make sure to mute your mic, uh, be respectful with your comments, be brief when sharing, uh, and please sign up for our newsletter. Uh, that link will also be in the chat. Join us for our following sessions uh, this week. On Thursday of 3rd of February, we have two sessions, which is Ask the Expert, which is a bilingual session on college and career. And then we also have a English North Star session. So that's uh, learning computer skills where you can gain certifications. And that's um, from 1030 to 12. Once again, everyone, welcome to another face-to-face -face session. Uh, once again, my name is Sarai. I'm Parent University Coordinator of Network 4. Um, today we have a health and wellness session. Uh, some quick instructions for our Spanish speakers, if, if you guys would give me a quick moment uh, to give those instructions. Otra vez, bienvenidos a todos. Uh, les quiero dar la bienvenida en otra programación de Cara a Cara. Hoy tenemos um, una sesión de salud y bienestar. Si ocupan la interpretación al español, por favor, háganos el favor de hacerle clic al icono del mundo y escoja el canal de español para escuchar toda la presentación en español. Pero siéntanse libres, por favor, de um, hacer sus preguntas en el chat y vamos a llegar a esas preguntas al fin de la presentación. Bienvenidos. Thank you so much. Um, so I just want to give a great, great welcome to Ellen and Justine. Um, thank you so much for being here with us today and providing this great information for us. Uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself, I hand you over the mic. Hello, uh, my name is Ellen Board. I am a health educator with Respiratory Health Association, and I'm really excited to be presenting this afternoon. Hi, everybody. My name is Justine Britton. I use she, her pronouns. I am the nutrition program manager in the Office of Student Health and Wellness, and I'm going to kick it back over to Ellen for the presentation. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Okay, I'm gonna share my slides. To start, we do have a quick survey. So if you would take a moment, you can scan the QR code or type in the link just there. It's a quick survey just to kind of gain some knowledge about what the pre-existing knowledge is of the audience before we move into our material. Um, while you're completing that, I will just give a little bit of background on the organization. So Respiratory Health Association did start as the Chicago Tuberculosis Association. And as time has gone on, we have transformed to meet the needs of the community. So right now we do a lot of work around policy, environmental policy and education policy relating to lung health. And on my end of things, I focus on our asthma programs. One of my colleagues is also in the meeting observing. So she's we're all learning this material and we're really excited to be sharing it with you. So I am going to leave that up for just another moment um, if you wanna scan it and complete it while I go over the first little intro portion. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, we can address them all at the end. Couple more people in the waiting room. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to start moving forward, but we can always come back to that survey. So today we will be presenting our asthma management presentation. We deliver this presentation to parents, such as this audience, but also to school staff and park district staff. And we talk about how to help students with asthma. So the topics that we'll be covering today are some of the asthma disparities in the United States and Illinois, the warning signs of an asthma episode and how you can identify a young person who's having trouble, triggers of asthma and how to reduce them in the home setting, 
some of the medications that a student diagnosed with asthma might take and proper inhaler technique, as well as special considerations for parents and some more information about documentation. So to start a little overview of asthma. So asthma in the US, this is just some statistics based on the US, asthma affects Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Asthma affects a lot of children in the US, 5 million children. All of these statistics are from 2019. We're still waiting on some of the 2020 and 2021 data. Nearly one in 14 children in the United States have asthma and nearly half of all children with asthma have had at least one asthma episode in 2019. So with that statistic, what we see is that nearly half of all children do not have their asthma under control. And it means that they're visiting the ED or they're needing extra care for their asthma. Asthma is responsible for nearly 10 deaths a day or over 3,500 deaths per year. So to talk a little bit about the disparities of asthma, asthma is a disease that is really, really disparate across race and across socioeconomic class. So we see that Black children are most affected by asthma. Black communities have the highest burden of asthma, whereas white families and white children have a much lower burden. Hispanic families also have a fairly high burden. And in terms of socioeconomic class, you can see in the diagram on the right that Families that are closer to the poverty threshold have higher burdens of asthma. This is due to a lot of factors, lack of access to reliable medical care, um, those families being closer to large pollutants um, and higher areas of public transportation and emissions. So it's a disease that is very different for different groups. To talk about asthma in Illinois specifically, in Illinois, nearly 10% of children are diagnosed with asthma and over 13,000 children visited the ED in 2019 due to their asthma. So again, that's showing us that those children do not have their asthma under control if they're having to make frequent emergency department visits. Black children with asthma visit the emergency department 5.5 more times than white children and asthma is a leading cause of school absenteeism. So when we talk about absenteeism, we mean that students are having asthma symptoms so severe that they are missing school. They're not able to get into school. And also that absenteeism can lead to their parents being absent from work. If you have a student who um, has an asthma episode, their parent will need to stay home with them or take them to the emergency department. So it's also a leading cause of missed work um, and loss of wages. This is just a look at what asthma looks like in the state of Illinois. Um, if you look in the top right of the map, you can see Cook County. It's really, really dark blue. That shows that there is a really high burden of asthma emergency department visits in Cook County. And at Respiratory Health Association, our data shows that a lot of the burden of asthma is on the south side and west side of the city. And so that's where we focus a lot of our outreach. So why do people have asthma? Why is it diagnosed? Um, this, is, this is a multifactorial disease. So there's a lot of reasons why a young person might be diagnosed with asthma. Um, one is genetics. So if a parent has asthma, it's very likely that their children might have asthma as well. Allergies, we find that students that are diagnosed with asthma also often have allergies as a comorbidity. They go hand in hand. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Environmental exposures, so when a young person, when their airways are still small and very sensitive when they're younger, if they're exposed to things like tobacco, allergens, or air pollution, their airways can become sensitized and therefore they can develop asthma. And also there is some research to show that viral infections in infancy can also lead to making those airways more sensitive and um, making students more likely to develop asthma. So just another overview of what asthma is. So it's a chronic lung disease that causes inflammation and narrows the airways. Um, asthma cannot be outgrown. It is a chronic condition. And we'll talk a little bit about this in a moment. 
anyone who has ever been diagnosed with asthma can experience symptoms at any time. So a lot of times we have adults who say, oh, well, I was diagnosed with asthma when I was younger, but I haven't had an asthma episode in years. So I don't have asthma episodes or I don't have asthma anymore. I grew out of it, but it is a chronic condition. Many people will experience that their asthma symptoms are less severe as they grow because they, their airways become stronger, they are less exposed to their triggers, um, and their medication is working better. So asthma is a lifelong condition, but it's incredibly controllable when managed. So that's managed through trigger avoidance and through medication. We really like to emphasize to students when we do our student program that you have asthma your whole life, but asthma does not have to affect your whole life. You can play sports and play your favorite instrument and do all of the things that you want to do. You just need to be ready to control your asthma. So again, um, can you outgrow asthma? No. When properly diagnosed, asthma is a lifelong disease. Symptoms may go away for a period of time. Um, we also find that sometimes students or very young people, they might be misdiagnosed. They might have another respiratory issue and it might be diagnosed as asthma. And when they grow into adults, they may think, oh, I outgrew it, but it just means that they were misdiagnosed as a child. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what goes on in the body when you have an asthma episode. On the right, you can see a controlled airway or a controlled asthma airway. And on, oh, excuse me, on the left, you can see a controlled airway. And on the right, we have an uncontrolled airway. Um, so can anyone maybe put in the chat box what they see um, about the uncontrolled airway on the right that makes it different from the controlled airway? There are three things that we point out when we have these um, presentations. Yeah, so someone said a blocked bronchial. Exactly. So um, we call these the three asthma S's when we do this program with students. Um, it makes it a little bit easier. Someone put inflamed. Yeah, great. These are great responses. Thank you. So um, when we do this program with adults, we use scientific terms, but for the students, we call these the three asthma S's. Um, and these are squeezing or bronchoconstriction. So that is when the um, muscles around the airway are squeezing tight. You can see that kind of in this first section there. The second S is swelling or inflammation. So this is when the walls of the airway become thick and inflamed, kind of like if you get a bug bite and it becomes swollen. And then the last asthma S we say is snot um, or mucus. So an increased mucus production in the airway will also prevent air from getting through. So these are the three asthma S's, squeezing, swelling, and snot. We're gonna move into triggers. So what actually causes an asthma episode? Um, there are two main types of triggers. Irritants aggravate the airways and allergens will cause sensitive airways to react. Um, we distinguish these by saying, so irritants will bother everyone. I myself have not been diagnosed with asthma, but an irritant will still bother my airways versus allergens will cause someone who is allergic to that allergen to react. So it's important to know what a child's triggers are and how to avoid them. So we're gonna start with some of the irritants. So again, these will be things that bother everyone. Um, the first common irritant that we like to talk about is smoke. So obviously on the left, we have cigarette smoke and also smoke from an electronic cigarette but this could be smoke from any source. It could be smoke from a cigarette, but it could also be a candle, or sorry, not a candle, um, a bonfire, a barbecue grill, um, cooking in the home that maybe gets smoky. So any sort of smoke will irritate someone's airways. It's important to note that young people that have asthma should not smoke. No one with asthma should smoke. Um, we believe at RHA that no one should smoke at all, but especially people with asthma, because it can be a very, very terrible irritant to their airways and can cause a lot of issues. We also like to point out the danger of secondhand and thirdhand smoke as well. So secondhand smoke is the smoke that is exhaled from someone's mouth when they are smoking a cigarette. Um, and thirdhand smoke is what you can see on this photo on the right. So 
This is a home of a heavy smoker. And you can see that the walls are kind of stained. And this is where pictures were hanging or a mirror. And the cigarette smoke actually sticks to porous surfaces like walls or upholstery, and it can stick around for a long time. So as a caregiver, how can you help a young person avoid these triggers? You can remove smoking from the home and the car, again, because of those surfaces that third-hand smoke can stick to. To prevent secondhand smoke, individuals who do smoke should move 15 feet away from doors or windows. And this applies to cigarette smoke and to electronic cigarettes as well. If you do smoke, um, wearing a jacket while you're smoking and then taking it off before you interact with a young person can help reduce their exposure to secondhand smoke. And it's always important to wash your hands after smoking. The repetitive um, hand to mouth movement can spread germs and can also spread the secondhand smoke. Another common irritant is air pollution. This is something that's um, important for us to know living in a city like Chicago. So especially in the summer when it's hotter, you're gonna see this haze around the city. Um, and it's important to be checking the air quality and air pollution because it can be a common irritant and can pose risk to young people with asthma. So good, this green zone, um, air pollution has little to no risk. Moderate is the yellow zone. Um, there is air pollution out there, but um, it might not be bad enough to take any action, but it's good to be aware of. Unhealthy for sensitive groups or the orange zone, that is when you wanna start considering moving children inside. And then unhealthy, um, common, ir uh, common irritant is this unhealthy air pollution, and that is a risk for everyone. So actions for caregivers are keeping windows and doors closed whenever possible and using an air conditioner. We see a lot of air pollution, um, especially in the summer. And so using your air conditioner, if you can during the summer to help filter it a little bit, keeping outdoor activities indoors, moving indoors during the peak hours, one to 4 p.m., which is that really high heat of the day, and checking airnow.gov for air quality updates. This is a really accessible website. You can see the air quality in your area at any time, and it also has air quality predictions. Another common irritant is strong odors. So this could be anything like a cleaning spray, a perfume, a deodorant. Um, for these, we recommend to use low odor or scentless disinfectant wipes instead of sprays. Anything that you can keep out of the air, anything that you can keep out of the air as an aerosol is really important. Um, diluting your cleaning products as well. Cleaning products are really effective even when they are diluted. And it's important to keep our homes and spaces clean, which we'll talk, touch on later, but sometimes those really strong odors can be irritating to sensitive airways. And avoiding air fresheners and sprays and cologne and perfumes, especially if you know that you're gonna be around a young person who has asthma. Um, we get a lot of questions about people who worry about, you know, I, I like using an air freshener, I like my home smelling a certain way. And we recommend using something like a wax melt or an oil diffuser, because that will not, um, put you know, aerosol into the air, it just kind of releases the scent. So that can be another option for you. Another common irritant is weather extremes. So in really hot weather, kids are running around, they're getting sweaty. Again, that air pollution and the pollen um, can be worse during hot weather. And cold weather, because the air is really dry, it can irritate the airways. So for cold weather, um, right now, obviously, kids are wearing masks a lot more, and so encouraging them to wear a scarf over their mouth or a mask over their mouth and nose um, to hydrate the air that they're breathing in, and if they need to, keeping activities indoors. For hot weather, um, restricting outdoor activities, again, during those peak hours between 1 and 4 p.m. when it's really hot, checking airnow.gov, being mindful of those air pollution um, days, ensuring children are well hydrated and taking breaks frequently, and again, using your air conditioner if possible. So allergens, this is again, just reiterates so that was all irritants. Um, irritants will bother anyone. Allergens will bother young people who are allergic to them. And again, we see a lot of students with asthma also have um, allergies. So a common allergen is animals with fur or feathers. Um, this one can be a little touchy because obviously we all love our pets, but they can be a common allergen, especially for young people with asthma. 
Um, so this is coming from the fur and the dander and even the saliva that these animals produce. So how to reduce this allergen? One is if you don't have a pet, um, making sure that you don't get one because um, it might trigger those allergic reactions. So keeping pets out of the home if you don't already have one. If you do already have a pet, um, one thing, one solution that we like to provide is to keep animals out of the children's room. So kids spend anywhere between six to nine hours in their bedroom sleeping. And so the most that you can keep a pet out of their room, keep that fur and dander out of their room, the better. And keeping children's room clean. So doing their laundry, washing their linens as frequently as possible and dusting. Our next allergen is, excuse me, mold. So when we talk about mold, we're talking about the mold that grows in dark, damp, places such as bathrooms and basements, not necessarily the mold that you find on food. For preventing mold growth, you should keep areas clean and dry. Um, the fans in your kitchen and in your bathroom are a great way to do that. Exhaust fans really do have a great effect on reducing mold growth. Using a dehumidifier to help keep the humidity level in your home. Um, cleaning things with bleach to help reduce mold. But the biggest thing with mold is that if you don't fix it at the source, it's really hard to totally eradicate it. So if you know you have an issue with mold in your home, finding ways to fix that if you um, live in a rental property, contacting your landlord and getting the source of the mold fixed is the best solution. Another common allergen is grass, trees, and the pollens that they produce. So this is another one that we really like to highlight going into the spring and summer. Less of an issue now in the winter, but definitely coming up when things start blooming again. So if children are prescribed an allergy medication for a pollen allergy, making sure that they're taking it consistently, making sure that they're um, keeping up with that, keeping windows and doors closed, again, using air conditioning, and not hanging things outside to dry. Another common allergen is dust and dust mites. And again, our guidance is cleaning regularly, sweeping, wiping down surfaces, vacuuming. Um, soft toys will often collect dust. And so keeping those stored in plastic will help reduce that. Using allergy proof covers and washing things in hot water frequently to help reduce the dust. Another common allergen is roaches and rodents. Again, living in a city, this is something that we encounter a lot. Um, again, these are animals that produce you know, dust and dander. So with things like roaches and rodents, they want three things. They want food, water, and shelter. So as much as you can limit their access to that, that's a really good thing. Cleaning up spills, making sure that food is sealed in containers, there's not crumbs, keeping things clean. And just like with mold, it's important that you fix the source of the problem. So sealing any cracks and holes to prevent them from entering into the home at all and using traps as well. Some other triggers that we reference are respiratory illnesses like colds and flus. So making sure that students, you know, get flu shots, are washing their hands frequently, sneezing into their elbow. Um, strong emotions, we really like to emphasize that emotions themselves do not cause asthma episodes, but when a young person is laughing or crying, their breathing patterns will change and that can often trigger an asthma episode. Exercise as well will um, sometimes trigger asthma episodes. There are some people diagnosed with asthma who their only triggers exercise and we call this exercise induced asthma. And again, um, cold, dry air, can also irritate the airways when you're exercising. We also like to say that young people with asthma should not limit their activity level. Um, having asthma doesn't mean that you can't exercise at all. It's just important to monitor it. So we're gonna move into talking about treating asthma and what asthma treatment looks like. So to diagnose asthma, it's based on a couple of things. Symptoms and family history. We like to talk about how um, with young people, especially children under the age of six months, it can be very, very hard to diagnose asthma because their airways are so small. So it's important to monitor your child if you think they might develop it based on family history. 
Um, there might be a lung function test that is done at the children's pediatrician. And it's very difficult to diagnose in young people, but if you su suspect that a young person in your life has asthma, um, it's important to talk to a physician. Um, there are two different types of asthma medication. The first is quick relief medication or albuterol. And the second one is long-term controller medication or an inhaled corticosteroid. These medications perform very two different functions. So it's important to know the difference and when you should be using them. Quick relief medication, you might've also heard it called a rescue inhaler or an emergency inhaler. This helps to relieve the squeezing during an asthma episode. So one of those asthma S's, the squeezing, the bronchoconstriction, that is what quick relief medication helps. Everyone diagnosed with asthma should have quick relief medication with them at all times. They should have it, um, if they're too young to carry it in their backpack, it should be at the nurse, it should be with a responsible adult, or if you feel comfortable with it, they can have it with them in their bag. A quick relief medication should work within 10 to 15 minutes of taking it, and students who take quick relief medication should take it at the first sign of an asthma episode. So as you can see at the bottom, we have a squeezing airway. Um, when you add the quick relief inhaler, you get a relaxed airway. Long-term controller medication is our second form of medication. This prevents the swelling and the snot in the airways, and it provides long-term control. Um, swelling and snot are the two symptoms that, if you are diagnosed with asthma, are happening in your body all the time. Um, this is a medication that is used daily even with no noticeable symptoms. So this is a big part of asthma management, making sure that you're taking your medication, even if you're not having symptoms. If you're not having symptoms, your medication is working. Um, not every child will be given a long-term controller medication. It's really up to their pediatrician or their physician to decide if they think it's the right move. But again, everyone should have a quick relief inhaler. As you can see at the bottom, snot and swollen airways, plus controller medication equals the controlled airway. So these are some of the commonly used medications. You may recognize some of these as something a young person in your life uses. Um, we like to point out that a lot of them look alike. So Pro-Air and Flovent often get mixed up. And so we like to emphasize that it's important for the young person and the adult in their life to know not just what their medication looks like, but also the name of it. So next we like to go over holding chambers and spacers. Um, this is what we use um, and what we give out during our youth program. So you can see them over here on the left. Sometimes when students take their medication, it can get stuck in their mouth and they end up swallowing it and it's not very effective. So a holding chamber helps to get more medication into a young person's lungs and therefore makes it more effective. If you are using a meter dose inhaler, you should use a spacer every time. This is just a quick video to go over, excuse me. Um, this is just a quick video to go over proper technique. Um, I'm gonna play it if you can hear it, if you would just drop like a little note in the chat saying that you can hear it. Thank you. There is no audio, Ellen. Sorry, you said there's no audio? No, there's no audio. Okay. I will, excuse me. Okay. Taylor. Better? Yeah. You may have heard some people call this a quick relief inhaler or albuterol, which is the name of the medication itself in the inhaler. What does quick relief medication do? Quick relief medication helps fix the squeezing or the constriction of your airways during an asthma episode. Everyone with asthma should carry their quick relief medication with them at all times. The quick relief medication helps you breathe better and can fix or reduce your symptoms when you have an asthma flare-up. So it's 
Oh, excuse me. Sorry. It's important that you use your quick relief inhaler as soon as possible when you start experiencing warning signs. Quick relief medication should work within 10 to 15 minutes. What is a spacer and what does it do? A spacer is a plastic tube with a mouthpiece on one end. You attach the spacer to the quick relief medication so that your medication goes deep into your lungs and you can breathe it in easier. The spacer also holds your medication in place so that it doesn't escape when you are breathing in. Now that we know what a quick relief inhaler and a spacer both are, I'm going to show you how to use them. I'll first go through the steps and then provide a demonstration. First, you will remove any candy, food, or gum from the mouth. Then you will remove the cap of your inhaler and attach it to the spacer. Then you'll shake the inhaler and spacer for five seconds. Then you'll stand up straight and breathe out slowly to empty your lungs. Then you'll close your mouth around the spacer mouthpiece. You'll press down on the inhaler one time and breathe it in slowly. You'll hold your breath for 10 seconds. Then exhale and breathe normally for 45 seconds. Repeat all these steps for additional doses of medication if that's what your doctor told you. If you're taking long-term medication, rinse your mouth with water and spit. I'm gonna show you how to use your spacer and inhaler. So first, I'm gonna remove any candy, food, or gum from the mouth. Then I'll remove the cap of the inhaler and attach it to the spacer like so. Then I'm going to shake the inhaler and spacer for five seconds. I'm going to stand up straight and breathe out slowly to empty my lungs. Then I will close my lips around the spacer mouthpiece and press down on the inhaler one time and breathe in slowly. Then I will hold my breath for 10 seconds. Then I will exhale and breathe out normally for 45 seconds. I will repeat all of these steps for more doses of medication if that's what my doctor told me. Now, you may feel a little funny after using your medication, but that is absolutely normal. Give yourself some time for your body to adjust. These feelings should go away within 10 to 15 minutes. Some of the things you might feel are a rapid heart rate, your heart beating fast, anxiety, feeling anxious or nervous with your hands getting clammy, shaky hands, jitteriness, restlessness, or a headache. I hope this video has been helpful. If you have any questions and would like to learn more about our asthma management or Fight Asthma Now programs, please send us an email at info at resphealth.org to connect with our team. Thank you. Okay, so... Just as she said, these are the instructions for using an asthma inhaler with a spacer. Um, you can also find that video on our website if you would like to watch it again. And we also talk about nebulizers because we often find that with younger children, nebulizers are commonly used. This is just another device that's used to deliver medicine. Um, it must be cleaned on a daily basis. So the parts of it that are cleaned are the face mask and mouthpiece, not the long tube as putting water in the long tube can cause mold growth. These are just some of the instructions for a nebulizer. Um, again, it's important to wash your hands using it. Um, nebulizer machines, the actual device itself can be shared, but the medicine cup should be individual for the child. It's important to keep nebulizer equipment clean to maintain the equipment and prevent infection. So again, removing the medicine cup, rinse it in water, letting it dry completely, um, cleaning it with mild soapy water once a week and replacing as needed. Just as she said in the video, there are some side effects to medication. Quick relief medication will often result in rapid heart rate, jitteriness, anxiety, headache, shaky hands. Um, and we say that if these symptoms do not get better within 10 to 15 minutes, you may need to administer more medication or take further action. 
Long-term controllers can cause a hoarse voice. They can also cause thrush or a yeast infection in the mouth. So we say it's important to rinse your mouth out with water after you take your long-term controller medication. Uncontrolled asthma, we talk about it in the rule of twos. So if a young person is using albuterol, using their quick relief inhaler more than two times a week, if they're waking up at night to use their quick relief inhaler more than two times a month, or if they're using more than two canisters of their quick relief medication um, in a year. So that's how we define uncontrolled asthma and it might be important to meet with a physician if your young person is experiencing this. This is how we define good asthma control for students. Students should be free from daytime and nighttime symptoms, have the best possible lung function. They should be able to fully participate in their activities, not miss school or work because of their symptoms, need fewer or no urgent care visits or hospitalizations, use medications to control their asthma with few side effects, and importantly, to be satisfied with their asthma care. We highlight these three because we find it really important to note that students should be able to do everything that they wanna do. Their asthma should not be a barrier for them to participate in school and in other activities that they're passionate about. Um, Well-controlled asthma requires teamwork, on the side of the parents, on the physicians, and the young person themselves. This is an asthma action plan. Um, we'll touch a little bit more on some of this documentation later, but schools are required to request an asthma action plan from families with a student with asthma. Everyone with asthma should have an asthma action plan, and this can be completed by a child's healthcare provider and it should be updated every year so that the schools are aware of any changes to a child's medication or to their triggers. We're gonna talk a little bit now about how to respond during an asthma episode. So early asthma warning signs can be something like a shortness of breath, cough, feeling tired or weak, itchy chin or throat, watery eyes, dark circles, or a stomach ache. So if a student with asthma is experiencing any of these symptoms, you wanna just assess them, um, notify if they're at school, the school nurse should be notified or appropriate administrator. If you can identify what's triggering these symptoms, move them away, um, administer their quick relief medication according to their asthma action plan and monitor the child. So if you know a student is having, or a young person is having um, an asthma episode, it's important not to leave them alone. So if you need to leave the room, taking the child with you or asking someone else to go and do what you need to do. Serious asthma warning signs can be that their quick relief medication is not working or doesn't last. So you've administered the medication, but their symptoms are persisting. They're wheezing, they have audible breathing increase in coughing or tightness in the chest and an inability to do usual activities. So again, if um, an appropriate person has not been notified, um, you should notify them of the student's condition, administer their quick relief medication if you haven't already. If symptoms are not better within 15 minutes of using quick relief medication, or if they get worse at any time, that's when you would want to contact emergency assistance, call 911. And if you are not the parent, then contact the student's parent. Repeat quick relief medication according to their asthma action plan and continue to monitor the child. Again, never leave them alone. Severe asthma warning signs can be severe shortness of breath. So the student is really having trouble breathing, difficulty walking or talking, retractions, which is sucking in. Um, you can see the bones of their neck and of their ribs and blue or gray lips and nail beds. So that shows that that student does not have great circulation because they're not able to breathe. Um, if a student has any one of these symptoms or more, you should call 911 immediately. This is a very severe asthma episode. Um, so it's important to get in touch with authorities as soon as you can. Calling the school nurse if they are at school, contacting the parent or guardian if you are not the parent or guardian, um, and if you have not already, administering their quick relief medication and monitoring them. So some special considerations for caregivers. According to Illinois law, students that are diagnosed with asthma must be permitted to self-carry and self-minister their own medication. So if a student is old enough and they feel comfortable carrying their medication in their backpack or having it in their locker at school, 
um, they must be permitted to do that and they must be permitted to self-administer their own medication when they want to. Um, if a child is younger, if they don't feel responsible enough for that, if you don't feel they're responsible enough for that, then their medication can be in the nurse's office or in the school office, but it should never be locked away. It should always be accessible. To get this self-administration form, you need written authorization from a parent for the self-carry and self-administration form. And you also need the prescription label with the name of the medication, the prescribed dosage, and um, all of the details about how the medication should be administered. You do not need a doctor's signature to self-carry and self-administer. You only need written authorization and a prescription label. So CPS requirements, students and caregivers should develop their asthma action plan like we talked about. Um, students diagnosed with asthma also may develop a 504 plan to provide accommodations. And um, that can be initiated by parents or guardians or the school. And again, those asthma action plans should be developed annually and renewed annually, it can be part of the student's yearly physical. Um, so the role for a parent or a guardian is to complete the requirements for a child to self-carry and self-administer. So again, that form and a prescription label, you do not need a doctor's signature. Provide the school with a copy of the student's asthma action plan. Review and child's asthma triggers and warning signs with their teachers. Um, if you wanna talk directly to their teacher about your child, um, it's absolutely a good idea to do that. Creating a 504 plan if the student needs reasonable accommodations. And if you're able to get a second prescription to have another quick relief inhaler for the student, you can do that as well so that they can have another one at school just in case. So I'm gonna turn it over to Justine really quick to touch on some of these details. Hi everybody, I just have a couple things to share from the CPS perspective. Um, uh, so this first slide is just a link to a website that has some videos on the chronic conditions reporting process. Um, so everything that I'm about to talk about on the next slide um, is covered in a, a video on that page. And the video is also available in several languages. So you can um, have it translated while you watch. Next slide, please. Okay, so in order to report your or, or a chronic condition at CPS, there are four basic steps to follow. And it's incredibly important to have the chronic condition reported um, so that the student can have the um, uh, appropriate accommodations available to them. So the first part is, or the first step is to access the necessary forms. Um, Ellen's already talked about some of these forms and we have them all available on our website at cps.edu slash medical forms. Next slide. Step two, is to um, have a medical provider complete and sign the forms. It's really um, imperative that a medical provider signs these forms because our nurses can only really um, act on orders that are from a medical provider. Next. Step three is to bring those signed forms and the medications that Ellen's just talked about back to the school. And then step four is to work on a 504 plan or some sort of emergency action plan with your school nurse. A few other resources from CPS. Like I said, the school nurse is probably person number one to touch base with. They can um, help set up a 504 plan and let you know of any accommodations that are available for your student in the school. The school clerk is also uh, a great resource as they can help you access any of the necessary forms. Um, our Children and Family Benefits Unit, or CFBU, you can call them and they will help you connect with uh, healthcare services, um, as well as um, enrolling in health insurance. Thank you so much, Justine. That was helpful. 
Um, so next, we're just going to talk a little bit about um, the role of school staff and what you should you know, expect from the school staff. So for school administrators and teachers, it's important that they know which students are diagnosed with asthma, especially if it's a student in their classroom. Not to disregard or minimize student statements related to asthma episodes, so taking students seriously when they report that they are feeling asthma symptoms. For students with an asthma action plan and or a 504, making sure that school staff understands those accommodations and the protocols in place for students. Talk to parents or guardians to understand the specific needs of students in their class and monitor students on days with poor air quality and making sure that we're paying attention to kind of those environmental things that might affect a student. These are some additional resources. Um, you can always visit our website. We have a vast library with reading about asthma if you're interested in learning even more. Um, we also have things regarding to smoking and lung health. Um, as well as some other um, environmental things like radon and air pollution. We also have our Fight Asthma Now program. So this is the program that we offer to students um, or offer to schools to offer to their students. We would come in and facilitate it. So if you think that your student could get something out of this program, please feel free to reach out to the school and let them know that you would like them to participate. I and um, my colleague Lorena are also doing a lot of outreach to the schools and hoping to get one scheduled. Well, you can also visit the CDC website, um, lots of information about asthma, as well as um, the Illinois government websites to talk about more asthma information. And these links will be in the chat. This is my contact information. I am one of our health educators. Um, if you have any other questions, you can feel free to email me or give me a call. Um, and if you want any more information, please let me know. And then we have our post-survey questionnaire. So again, if you wanna just scan this or type in the URL to complete the parent post-survey, we would really appreciate it. Um, it just gives us a little bit of information about what you learned and how we can improve. Thank you for putting that link in the chat as well. I appreciate that. Okay, um, and if anyone has any questions, um, I think now would be the time. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ellen. And I see that Alondra has a question. Alondra, please feel free to unmute and ask your question. Okay, perfect, it's in the chat. So how do you administer CORE to uh, asthma? So mm -hmm. if you're looking for more information about the administration of medication, I can also, that um, video, I could also find that link and put it in the chat as well, which would be helpful. So, sorry, she, it was a mistype. Uh, she oh, meant CPR. CPR, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's a good question. We get this a lot from, um, you know, people who are concerned that if there is a, um, an emergency. Um, and on our end, we would recommend that um, you speak to a medical provider about that. We are not, um, we cannot you know, give medical advice, but there's a lot of resources to get CPR certified and trained. Um, the American Red Cross is a really good resource to get CPR training. Um, and that would be a really good place to start. And you could also speak to, um, you know, your young person's physician to get more information about that. But I would say the American Red Cross is a fantastic place to start if you're looking for CPR training. Yes, perfect. Thank you so much for that, Ellen. And then I see that Christina has her hand raised. Feel free, Christina, to unmute. Hi, yes, I have a question for the questionnaire. Um, I've been having problems with that. So do I have to have another application to or download um, something so I could the bar for the barcode? Um, you should be able to just scan it or if you look in the chat, there is the URL um, that you could use as well. Oh, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And then let's see. 
Um, people are asking the, uh, if our, your contact information can be put in the chat. Yes, absolutely. I will definitely. And then I know a parent didn't put in a question of, are natural scents less irritating than artificial ones? That's a really good question as well. Um, so with the scent thing, we talk about how it's less the smell itself and more the way it's delivered. So if it's a spray, like an air freshener, that's gonna um, bother someone's lungs or even um, a diffuser that has like the mist that comes out, anything that's in that setting is going to bother someone's lungs. Um, so if you wanted to use scents in your home, you could use, you know, a wax melter or something like that, or even like a wall plug-in can also um, be a fine alternative. Awesome, thank you. And then I see another person has their hand raised and I hope I don't butcher this name, I apologize. Is it Birina? Awesome. Uh, you know, you, your audio sounds a little low. Oh. Okay. Uh, can you still hear me? We can. We can hear you. You can go ahead. Uh, the question is: Every time they do the, the inhaler, because I have this little girl that comes in and she shakes it, right? She takes her puff and then she shakes it again. I think she takes it like. Um, I think she, um, she takes it all the time. You don't have to take it all the time, just one time, right? So we recommend that you shake it for five seconds. Um, so for young people, if they want to count it out, you definitely need to shake it before it's administered because it helps to um, make sure that the medication is evenly distributed um, in the puff. Um, if they shake it afterwards too, it's not a bad thing. Um, so, but yeah, they definitely need to shake it before for five seconds. And if he does it, if he does it, every time she's going to take a puff, she shakes it like five times. I'm like, I can only do it one. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, five seconds is our recommendation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any more questions? I uh, feel free to ask them now. Uh, just meanwhile, kind of going back to the sense, a parent was asking, I know we talked about um, secondhand smoke and thirdhand smoke. They were asking if it's not cigarette related, tobacco related, if it's, for example, sage, they're saying burning sage or, or like natural leaves and stuff like that to kind of bring that scent into the home. Um, is that also um, bad since we know that it's smoke? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, any, so for Respiratory Health Association, our guidance is that anytime you're breathing something in that isn't clean air, that is going to irritate your airways. So um, smoke from a uh, burning sage or burning um, other sorts of like natural herbs like that can also irritate the airways. And so if that's something that's important to you, I know people use that in their homes for various reasons. One way that we would recommend is that um, doing it and maybe having like a ventilation system so that the, air, the smoke can be vented out easily after you do it um, or doing it while the young person isn't in the home. In terms of secondary smoke from things like burning sage, I don't know if there would be secondhand smoke or thirdhand smoke from those, um, but we could look into that. But that is a good question. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. Okay, we have a couple more minutes to see if anyone has any more questions. Please feel free to unmute or put it in the chat and I can read it out to uh, our presenters for today. And then I know, Justine, we talked about medications in schools. Um, is there any way students can carry the inhaler around with them or do they have to be left uh, in the main office? Because I know certain medications do have to be left in the office. Yep, as long as the right paperwork is on file, a student can carry their inhaler with them. Perfect, perfect. 
also this is um, more information that we give to schools, but we also like to emphasize it to parents. Um, there was a law passed, I believe in 2020, to help schools get stock albuterol in their schools. So um, providing avenues for nurses to just have stocks of inhalers. Um, so if a student does need one, they can get it that way. Um, that's something that we work on in terms of helping find schools, helping get schools funding for that. Perfect, then Ellen, just to elaborate on that, would it be a one specific type of brand or is it like catered to like various students? It would be albuterol. So it would be a, um, a quick relief inhaler. I'm not sure which brand it would be, but it would be that um, medication. Perfect, perfect. Perfect, so let's give parents one more minute to see if there's any last questions. But before we do that, uh, Ellen, Justine, are there any and important ending notes uh, that you kind of want parents uh, and everyone viewing us today to go home with? Just something to keep in mind. I would say just make sure you're communicating with your physician. Um, and I really think it's important to emphasize that um, students who have asthma do not need to have a lower quality of life. They don't need to not do the things that they enjoy. Um, and if you work together with your student and the school and their physician, they can enjoy all of the things that they love to do um, just as much as a child that doesn't. It does not need to affect their life. And um, we really are passionate about that side of asthma education. Of course. Awesome. Well, yes, I think that's very, very well. Yes, Justine, I think that's very, very well said uh, on Ellen's behalf. I mean, I, I think once uh, the topic of asthma is brought up, it, it brings a lot of, of fear for, for our children, especially when it comes to, to physical activities in school. Uh, I mean, their children, they, they want to do, you know, everything. And it's important to know that they are still able to. It just comes with, you know, making sure, like you said, that they communicate um, with their doctors and are able to take proper precaution um, when doing, you know, just daily tasks. Perfect. Well, I really appreciate you both coming today and giving us this wonderful information. And I know our parents appreciate it as well. Um, their chat, their, I'm sorry, their information is still in the chat. Uh, so please feel free to take a quick screenshot of it um, before we leave today's session. I appreciate you all being here with us today. Uh, Ellen and Justine, once again, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful workshop. And I look forward to seeing you all in uh, the upcoming face-to-face -face sessions. I, I thank you all and I hope everyone has a wonderful night. Thank Take you. Care, Thanks, Ellen.